Cool. So we are live then. Um, and I guess I sent you a message uh, around about a week ago, just because I thought it'd be interesting to talk to you a bit about your journey and then what it is that you're doing now as a whole. Um, and maybe we might get into a few of the specific things because I've seen you going back and forth with some Christian apologists on uh, dating of certain books and things in uh, the Old Testament specifically. But I thought as well, like just finding out a bit about your background and stuff might be an interesting thing. Cool. Yeah. Well, um, for anybody that doesn't know me, I'm Dr. Joshua Bowen. Um, I run a YouTube channel with my wife, Megan, who is really the better half of the channel. Uh, she's the the one with all the great ideas. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't know where exactly you want me to, to go. Uh, I can, I can talk about, I guess if you start off with like, uh, my understanding at least is that you yourself used to be a Christian Mm -hmm. and your wife still identifies as a Christian. Is that Mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Um, so maybe talking a bit about, um, that, that background for yourself and um, how you got to where, what your position is now sure. um, and what led you there as well. Yeah, so I grew up um, in a, a very fundamentalist uh, Christian, Christian household. Uh, I was saved probably at the age of five. Um, there aren't many things that I remember uh, from my early childhood, uh, which has not been uh, aided by, I, I have MS. So that's, that's oh, really? yeah, yeah, that screwed up yeah, my memory even more, right. which is awesome. But one thing that I do remember is getting saved and, yeah. uh, I was sitting on a bunk bed and I remember that I was terribly afraid <clears throat> that, uh, I was going to hell Yeah, and, uh, I hadn't, I hadn't asked Jesus into my heart quite correctly enough. Uh, and I remember you know, my mother came in and I was crying and she said, what's wrong? And I said, I, you know, I, did I do it right? I'm not sure I did it right. How do you know if you did it right? And, uh, you know, she said, you only, you only have to do it once. Um, and, you know, growing up in that sort of, in that sort of a household, um, you know, my grandparents were incredibly influential in my life. He was, a, my grandfather was a, a Baptist minister. Right. And, uh, so, you know, I was, we were always talking about the Bible. The Bible was, um, it w- wasn't some ancillary thing. It was really foundational to how we lived our lives and everything was measured against it. Um, and, you know, that, that sort of, um, uh, that sort of grew stronger when I joined the air force and I was 17, uh, had a lot of alone time and began to read rather extensively in my denominations writings. And, um, you know, then I, then I became incredibly arrogant because I, I'd read books. So now I knew things and, uh, most other people didn't know things. Yeah. Uh, so I started teaching a Bible study at the base and, um, yeah, you know, it, it became, it became clear that, uh, you know, evangelizing and, and, and bringing people to Christ even more than what, what it had been before was important given that I, I actually knew, uh, you know, deep theological matters. Uh, so I could, I could really instruct people at that point. Uh, so I became, uh, I, I got out of, off of active duty and became a lieutenant in the Air Force and uh, started moving toward becoming a chaplain, uh, which brought me to seminary. So I started my, uh, I got my bachelor's degree in religion and then started my master's degree at a seminary and uh, started pastoring. Uh, I was associate pastor of a church out in Virginia for six or seven years. And, uh, you know, during that time, I mastered Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and, you know, all the, all the other essential biblical languages and um, because I did relatively well in that uh, in that seminary program, I was able to get a, a scholarship to Johns Hopkins University uh, in the Assyriology program, so studying the uh, studying the ancient Near East. So I, uh, I I graduated from seminary with a master's um, in theology and Old Testament studies, and. Uh, focusing on Semitic languages, and then 
when I got into Hopkins, I went in as an Assyriologist with a minor in Hebrew Bible. So I took uh, an awful lot of Sumerian and Akkadian and more advanced Hebrew and Aramaic. And um, yeah, so uh, while I was there, though, we had to take, um, you know, the requisite uh, courses that everybody had to take. So there was a year long seminar on Mesopotamian history. There was a year long seminar on Egyptian history and then one on Syro Palestine. And it was the Syro Palestine. It went in a three year cycle, and the Syro Palestine was my first year there. Right. And it became incredibly difficult for me to maintain my, my fundamentalist understanding of the text and um, of the history. Um, in, so, in, so that, sorry to inter interrupt. No, that. sure. So that, that like, um, fundamentalist view of the text, like, what, how will you? viewing the world like how how were you looking at reality when you think back to like uh where you were at that time what what was your kind of outlook and your mm. view of the bible you know all, all these kind of big big questions about about life how would you have thought about it? yeah i mean had i had i been interested or any good at the sciences or or math i would have been a very um staunch proponent, I suppose, of young earth creationism. Of course, I was a young earth creationist, but uh, sure. you know, I, I hadn't gone into any of the, uh, you know, the rationale behind, um, you know, how that, how that works. But of course, my, my understanding was that uh, God created the world with apparent age. And so that accounted for any of the stupid arguments that someone might make of, you know, the earth being, you know, millions or billions of years old. Um, and so, you know, I, I, the earth was, you know, 6,000 years old and God created mankind, just as it says in Genesis 1 and 2. Um, there was a serpent, there was Adam and Eve, just as the story says, uh, in the sense that I, I use that, you know, this idea of a historical Adam and Eve in the sense that, you know, some more colloquially, I guess, if you had a camcorder and you went back in time and you, yeah. you know, you would see Adam and Eve there naked and talking to the snake. So... Uh, that was my understanding. I I was a dispensationalist, so uh, you know I looked for the imminent return of Christ in the rapture. Uh, so you know if you read the Tim LaHaye uh, Left Behind series, or you you know you watch those Left Behind movies about the rapture, that's you know what I what I believed, and uh, it was coming. Of course, we couldn't know when it was going to happen, uh, but but it was going to be soon. We thought. Um, so, you know, everything, everything in my life was not only colored by my beliefs, but it was, it was foundational to it. So, um, anything that I did, uh, you know, it was anything that I believed, anything that I, that I argued, it was always what saith the scriptures. That was one of my favorite things to say, what saith the scriptures. And that's how I said it too. What saith? <laughs> like um, King James. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah well, was... and uh, were you like, um, in terms of your like day-to-day -day life then, were you, were you looking at all of these things you're going about, like spiritual warfare being a thing that was involved or like, you know, saying leading these Bible studies and stuff like, uh, your responsibility to like save these people from eternal conscious torment. Was that how you were kind of thinking about these things? Oh yeah, no yeah. question. I mean, I, <laughs> because I was so smart, um, I knew that, that the more Pentecostal, the more charismatic side of, of the Christian faith, that was false, obviously, right. because I'm wicked smart and I didn't believe that. So, uh, you know, speaking in tongues, that was all a bunch of hooey. Um, and yeah, of course I could prove that, from the text, it was, yeah. uh, you know, um, I'm saying all of those things, uh, hopefully people understand this tongue in cheek, but yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I was, I was very, very intelligent and, uh, you know, that sort of, because of that, because I, because I knew the answers, because I knew I, I could come to the end of these, uh, these discussions and these debates. I, one of the one of the interesting things that I believed was that um, only the writings of the Apostle Paul were to us today in the church, the body of Christ. So, you know, the writing like the Gospels and, of course, the Old Testament and even, um, you know, like the book of Hebrews through Revelation, all that stuff was written to the nation of Israel. 
uh, but Paul's epistles, those are the ones that were to us. So, you know, one of the things that our denomination held was that water baptism was something that was just for Israel. Um, and it, for some godforsaken reason, we had to argue, that was our calling card. We argued that ad nauseum with people. And I remember, you know, walking into a pastor's office one day, uh, a Baptist minister's office, and uh, saying, you know, water baptism isn't for today's church. And of course, as a Baptist, that didn't go over yeah. terribly well. And he said, well, let me explain why it is. And I said, let me stop you. And I'm like, you know, 17, 16, something <laughs> like that. Let me stop you. <laughs> I looked at all his books on his shelf and I said, before you continue, I know what all these books say about water baptism. I know what you're going to argue, but let me tell you why it's wrong. I mean, that was the, right. that was the position that I had. And, um, so ending up at Hopkins, ending up, um, having to engage, uh, in such a way that, uh, you know, it became, it became clear very quickly that what I knew, I, I actually didn't know. Sure. Um, well, well, what were some of these objections that kind of broke through that armor then? That's kind because of, I, guess, I guess you must have been filtering a lot of this stuff for a while as well. And, you know, like words, I like I know people who they'll hear words like biblical uh, textual criticism or something. And it just it goes through like a filter, like um, oh, liberal heresy, uh, people who hate God. And then it's like they just can ignore all those things. And uh, yeah, I mean, I would say one of the things I, I feel like I'm somewhat of an odd case. Um, in that I had that, you know, what people might consider that a college experience very late. Right. And, and after having gone through an awful lot of, uh, an awful lot of training. Um, so, you know, by the time that I got to Hopkins, I had done a lot of textual criticism, you know, both of the, the, the new Testament and the old, uh, I was, you know, I, I translated through probably the hardest passages in the New Testament, certainly those in the, in the old. Um, and I understood, you know, I'd written papers on textual criticism. And so, you know, those sorts of things, um, they weren't at issue for me because I understood the, I understood the linguistic side of it. And one of the things that my seminary did was they they had sort of an apologetics angle. They didn't call it that. Um, but for example, there was a class that we had to take and it was critical issues and Bible backgrounds. That's what it was called. Okay. And so I remember, you know, taking exams on things like, um, you know, how could Genesis one be true and how could Jonah have survived in the belly of a fish or, you know, those, those, those sorts sure. of things that, common attacks that would come. It was, it was very much uh, a, an apologetic style class. Uh, and that the danger with that, of course, as I'm, I'm sure you know, is that you go in knowing what the answer is, right? Knowing okay. what the answer has to be. Yeah. And then just trying to figure out how to get there. Okay. Um, yeah. Is there, is there a possible way that you can get there? And, you know, when, when you do things like exegesis of a text whatever text that you're doing it's that's a really bad approach um so then when i got into um when i got into hopkins all of my flashy you know uh defenses of the of the of the biblical text um well they just they just fell um, oh, okay. Because Was that because of the objections being like ones you weren't used to? Or? I would say, I would say because, and, and, and I'm afraid that this is true for a lot of people that have um, gone to certain seminaries. I'll say that. Um, the seminary isn't, isn't as rigorous perhaps as it should be. And you don't, um, information that that really should be set set before the students is not and it's it's not i don't think it's intentionally um kept from students but it's it's maybe the training just isn't there to do so okay. uh but you know having to having to deal as a whole 
with um, ancient Near Eastern and biblical archaeology, those sorts of things, or um, you know the literature uh, from Mesopotamia and its effects upon the biblical text. Those sorts of things become very overwhelming very quickly, and um, the reason that I say I'm I'm an odd case and uh, that, that not every seminary obviously is like that. Uh, as I had a friend at Hopkins that I was one year ahead of him. And my first year was sort of filled with falling away from the faith and becoming an atheist. Um, and he, he called me, sorry, let me turn that off. Yes. Yeah, sorry. He, uh, he called me uh, new students or prospective students that are coming in will often call and talk to current students. And I was the only Assyriologist in the program at the time. And he called and we were talking and, and he told me that he was coming from Trinity um, Seminary out in Chicago. And uh, I said, oh, are, are you a Christian? And he said, yeah. And I said, all right, well, look, man, you got to get ready because this is going to be rough. And he said, well, I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean. And so I started going through the things that that drove me from my fundamentalism. Of course, he wasn't a fundamentalist. Um, right. And so he said, well, yeah, I've already, I've already sort of dealt with all those issues. <laughs> okay. um, now, the thing is, his faith, um, I, I suspect there are a lot of Christians out there that are either listening to this or would, you know, if they would listen to it, would say, he's not really a Christian any more than my yeah, wife is sure. really a Christian. Right. Uh, because you know, his, his beliefs take into account, um, genre and the reality of ancient Near Eastern history and archeology mm -hmm. and those sorts of things. Um, so his faith, you know, had, 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 had matured. Um, now we, he's my best, he's one of my best friends, if not my best friend now, He's actually out in your neck of the woods. He's oh, uh, right, okay. he's up at Tyndale. Oh, uh, really? Doing, a, doing a, some postdoctoral work as a researcher out there. But I actually talked to him uh, maybe a month and a half ago, and we were talking about some of these some of these issues. And I said, I, you know, I I still don't understand how you make sense of whatever it is we were talking about. Right. And yeah, I really I I, I love him. Uh, because his responses are, are very genuine yeah, and yeah. They're, they're, they're what I wish Christians on, particularly on social media, like YouTube, or whatever would do is his responses are, yeah, you know what? I, I, I understand why that seems um, problematic to you, but I, I, I don't put that past an omnipotent being. And I, you know, I, I have this objective experience with him. And, and so I have faith that I, I know him, uh, like I know the sun's going to come up tomorrow. And those are, those are, I think, very admirable, um, responses because what he's, what he's not trying to do is manipulate data to say, no, that stuff, yeah. you know, isn't, isn't really there. Uh, Ezekiel 26 really, you know, it, that's not really a, a, a failed prophecy. It's uh, it's something else. You don't understand it correctly. Right. There's some grammatical thing. You know, he doesn't he doesn't argue those types of positions because I think he's he's coming at this from a um, yeah. yeah. So anyway, I've rambled. Yeah, on. No, it's, no, sorry. I was gonna, sorry. yeah I, no because I've started um, going back to like uh, uh, to a Bible study at my church that I was at, and what you know one of the guys was talking to me afterwards and I was saying, well you know maybe I'm not a christian anymore but i'm not concerned with like the propositional content of my beliefs being right like like when i talk about god or who jesus is or what the bible is it's not about me having the right things to say and that makes i think conservative uh evangelical types really uncomfortable like yeah. thinking about things in that uh in that way um, yeah yeah it, because there's no finality and i think that's that there's no finality and there's no ability to be right um and uh and so we, uh, Megan is, um, Anglican. And right. so, you know, over here, we, she goes to, we, we go to an Episcopal church and, um, you know, the things that the Episcopal church, uh, are concerned with are not things that are doctrinal, right? You know, we're not, you know, they're not sitting around and, 
in Bible studies arguing about uh, whether the 12 apostles were in the body of Christ or out of the body of Christ, or, you know, how should we understand this particular, uh, you know, the, the, they say uh, the Nicene Creed or, you know, whatever, right. but, but uh, what they're concerned about is those people out on the street are pretty hungry. Yeah. yeah. So let's keep this food bank going. And, um, you know, we, we really want people to understand God's love. So how can we get them to come into our community? Well, Hey, let's, let's get, they do something called thirsty theology and they meet out at a pub and right. have some beers and talk about God. And to, you know, the people that I grew up with, that would be anathema, right? Yeah, but you can't, yeah. you can't, going into the world, you know, that's like smoking a cigar or something. Uh, you can't, can't do, can't do anything like that. But, uh, you know, they're more concerned with the relational aspects yeah. um, of faith and uh, meeting people's needs, physical needs. Right, and sure. So, but again, they're not real Christians. So, unfortunately for Megan, yeah. she's not a real Christian. So. Yeah. <laughs> So um, as, as you were then at university and you, you, did you just say you kind of transitioned into, into atheism and did you kind of want to then rebel against the position that you'd held? Like, did you think, oh, I've got to, you know, like, like these people are deluded. I've got to convince them out of these beliefs. Did you ever go into that kind of more hardcore type thing? Or You know, I, I would say um, maybe a little, there's, there wasn't really a lot of time during the, the PhD okay. program to do that. Um, but I do remember, uh, wanting to, wanting to broaden people's horizons. And, uh, I, 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 so people talk about, I just did a podcast uh, with a Canadian atheist and Michael's such a wonderful guy, but he, he started off the program talking about how humble I am. Okay. You know, and, and one of the reasons that I, and I really appreciate that it was really, really kind of him. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons that I, I strive to do that is because I'm not that way naturally at all. I'm right. quite the opposite. I tend to, I tend to get very arrogant and I've had to work hard to keep that sort of thing in check. Um, and a, a PhD, oddly enough, really, really helped with that because uh, you know you 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 learn so much that you realize how little that you know relatively speaking okay. um but i remember in the beginning during that during that initial year um that i was that i was going through this phase of atheism i remember my church asked me the the one that i used to to pastor at um asked me to do a sunday school lesson cuz you know one of the teachers were sick or something and going on vacation. I can't remember what. And so my way of, of sort of trying to bring them to the reality um, is I, I put, to, I put together this uh, Sunday school lesson where I had, I had PowerPoint slides and the first PowerPoint slide had uh, I think a passage from second Corinthians on okay. it, but there was no, um, you know, label. It didn't nothing that said, right. This is second Corinthians. It was just okay. the text. And I said, all right, who are my great scholars in here? Who can tell me where this is from? And, you know, a couple of people, Oh yeah, that's second Corinthians chapter two or whatever. And I said, okay, great. And then I put the next one up and it was from Ezekiel chapter one, but same thing, no citation. And they said, Oh yeah, you know, I can, I, that's Ezekiel. I think Ezekiel chapter one. Like, good, good. Okay. So then I clicked to the next slide and it said, um, as the flood waters receded, I sent out the, the, the dove and there was no place for it to land. So it came back to me. And the you know, second time I sent out you know, whatever. And then the third, I sent out the raven and the raven found land and it squawked around. I mean, it, it, it bobbed its head, whatever. And the waters have receded. Oh, that's the flood. You know, okay. That's, so it's that Genesis six, seven, maybe eight or something. And I said, it's the Epic of Gilgamesh. And uh, there was just silence. <laughs> right. And I, and I said, in the Epic of Gilgamesh predates, you know, the, 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 ori the origins of this story predate the biblical text probably by 1300 years, you know, or more. Which led to about 30 seconds of silence and then 45 minutes of no, you're wrong. You oh, don't right. know what you're talking about. <laughs> 
And, you know, I think that that has probably gone down in infamy at that church. And for anybody watching, I apologize. That was a really, really stupid thing to do. Um, I want to believe that my intentions were pure, but um, I think they were, they were clouded at least by arrogance. Um, so yeah, I'd say to some, to, to, to that extent, right, um, sure. you know, trying to, trying to share that knowledge. <laughs> so, so I suppose then to, from maybe that like kind of pendulum swing to where you are now then is, is what you see yourself as doing now, like purely like an academic scholarly thing, or is there some kind of like, um, moral dimension where it's like, well, this is an important thing for, for the truth or like, what, how, where'd you find yourself where you are now? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, I guess the best way to answer that is to, to talk just very briefly about how I, how we started doing YouTube. Um, I started, I, I never really watched YouTube. Uh, and I, I don't actually remember how it started, but I, I remember I ended up on Aaron Ra's channel, uh, watching Aaron Ra's videos. And that was really interesting, you know, watching, watching him talk about evolution and talk to people that were uh, of my, of my former ilk, I suppose you could say. And, and that, I ended up emailing him actually after a while. And I said, so I, I, when I finished, when I graduated from Hopkins in early 2017, um, circumstances in life uh made it so teaching was not an option for me to okay. pursue uh so i had to do what i'm doing now which is not teaching uh so you know i i was trying to find ways i taught at the church the episcopal church a little bit you know trying to find an outlet to keep the 14 15 years of grad school from not being a waste um and i remember I emailed Aaron and I said, look, here's my, here's my background. If this could ever be of any use, of course, Aaron, I, I didn't, I didn't hear a response from him, which didn't surprise me uh, greatly, but that it, it eventually brought me to the non sequitur show okay. and the non sequitur show. Uh, again, I don't remember which video it was, um, but I remember writing in to Kyle and saying, or I guess just to the show in general and saying, look, you know, here's who I am. And the response came back um, rather quickly. I think it was the same day saying, uh, let's set up a call. Um, anyway, so I eventually ended up on that show and just, you know, sort of, sorry. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> I have to turn off all my ringers clearly. Um you know, ended up, uh, uh, yeah, on the show. And at the end, of, I was talking about just, I think, ancient Near Eastern stuff and its relationship to the Bible, that sort of thing. And I remember Steve asking me, uh, there are people in the chat that are, uh, you know, saying that you should start a YouTube channel and I understand you're going to start one. And I look over and Megan is in the side chat, you know, next to me on the computer. And she's apparently told people, yeah, sure, we'll start a channel. Um, so that's, that's how we got into it. Um, and we started putting out just, you know, basic videos, little five minute videos, uh, called daily data right. on, you know, interesting little tidbits about the ancient near East and who the people were and what languages they spoke, that sort of thing. Um, but that very quickly evolved into, well, how does this apply to the biblical text? And uh, so I, st we, I tried to, in a lot of ways, keep the more contentious stuff off of the, off of our channel because it gives Megan a great deal of anxiety. Um, and I, it gives me some anxiety as well. Sure. Uh, so I tried to keep, tried to keep that sort of stuff off of the channel, but ended up on Skylar Fiction Show, um, which tends to be more contentious. Uh, sure. uh but yeah, I, I would say that in the end, you know, I just I just finished a book on slavery, and actually it it's probably going to be submitted to uh, the printer today, which is going to be awesome. 
but the the title of the book is did the old testament endorse slavery right and one of the things that i see i'd say slavery is sort of a good litmus test or it's a good example of what i see on social media and that is that you have on one side skeptics who sort of look for the worst in biblical topics and it's not that yeah. it, it's not often it's not that what they're saying is incorrect um but i think it would be tempered a bit by it'd be tempered a bit by more context uh generally ancient near eastern context yeah so you know when you when you say things like god condones rape in the old testament Yes, but no, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. because there's 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 a little bit of nuance to it because uh, and and so so then I see apologists yeah. respond and when they respond they over respond sure. and their over response is no the Bible doesn't endorse slavery or the Bible doesn't condone slavery, um, and and and. It's only, you know, like indentured servitude, which is like working at McDonald's. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, both of those positions, I think, are are in need of some nuance. Okay. And so the book, the book is one of the major goals is to to try to bridge that that gulf and to try to say, okay, look, here's what you've got right, and here's what you've got right, and if you if you put them together, you end up with a more complete picture. In reality, it does, it does, uh, you know, th that more complete picture, the skeptical side gets it more right. Sorry, they, <laughs> uh, you know, to those watching that might not like that, but, um, but, but I think it's, um, there was a, a video series back and forth that, uh, or Cosmic Skeptic put out a video series on slavery to which a guy right. named What Do You Mean responded. Yeah, sure. And in that, in that sort of back and forth, I then weighed in and, right. you know, the, the resultant video uh, series that I did basically said, cosmic skeptic is, is pretty much right on this. Now there are some yeah. things that he gets, he gets wrong and needs to, you know, they need to be tempered, but on the whole, his position is the right one. Yeah. And what he means is not, um, but, uh, but just because one side gets a little, you know, gets more right than the other doesn't mean that both don't need to sort of have that, yeah, that yeah. nuance made apparent. So uh, that's sort of, that's sort of what I'm trying to do. Um, yeah, I think, I think I kind of, I, I see that as well, where a lot of the atheist objections can be like, um, well, here's, I don't know, like slavery or war or certain, like something that's really culturally alien to us. Um, but they put the objection across just as like, so obviously uh, moral monster bad or whatever. And then yeah. Christians, um, because especially, especially the apologist types, because they're intimately familiar with a lot of these biblical stories, they hide behind knowing the stories better than um, some yeah. of the atheists do to say, well, obviously you don't know what you're talking about because you don't even know the story arc of the thing, like where, where your objection comes from. Yeah. And I, that, but then like, it's like, that's not the entire thing though, is it? Like there are problems in there, yeah. but because then sometimes... Um, so some people in the more skeptical camps are haven't gone and really like engaged with, um, you know, you know, like trying to understand the whole the whole context of what's going on. They've just seen the word and gone, oh, that's clearly bad. And um, then the apologists almost get away with it sometimes. Yeah, um, I was thinking for for yourself, what have been the kind of responses you've got from either the Christian apologist types or or even atheist types to doing some of this kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, I'd say that, that, the the two major topics that I've, I've dealt with in depth, uh, to date that are, you know, contentious like this, um, are slavery in the old Testament and the book of Daniel, the dating of the book of Daniel. Right. Um, and I've seen you going I, back and forth with SJ on that one. <laughs> yeah. Much, much to my chagrin. Um, and I would say that for the most part, the skeptical community is very much in favor of, of what I'm doing. 
Um, so I don't get a lot of pushback from the skeptical community. And, and again, I think that's reasonable and, and expected because I think for the most part, I'm, I'm agreeing with yet so tempering, I suppose, yeah, yeah. what it is that they're, what it is that they're arguing. Um, uh, of course, from the, from the fundamentalist community, there's significant pushback and flat denial. And I don't know what I'm talking about and just throw whatever it is up against the wall and see if it sticks. And that sort of stuff is frustrating to me as a researcher because um, I, I really struggle with it because I'm, I don't know if you can hear my two-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> very happy in the background. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, genuinely interested in understanding as much as possible um, the best interpretive my getting the best interpretive model right. for the data part of that reason is fear uh, because okay. the last thing that i want and this has been sort of drilled into me in the doctoral program is that if you're wrong about something it's going to be bad uh so you don't you don't want to be wrong about things <laughs> much better to not speak than be wrong okay uh, so I, I try not to comment on things that I, I, I'm not reasonably sure about. Um, so the, I, apologists take advantage of that from time to time. Okay. And they will say, if, uh, if you, you brought up SJ, I'll use SJ as an example, uh, whether she does it intentionally or not. Um, I remember I was on vacation uh, last year and I got something on Twitter that said, what do you do with Josephus talking about Alexander the Great uh, coming to? Um, Hi, buddy. <laughs> you're you have a metal pipe. <laughs> hi, are you bringing this to me? Thank you. Oh, at least sorry. he gave it over to you. You know. You want to come say it. hi? <laughs> come here. Come say hi. Come on, cuten up the stream a little. Wow. <laughs> oh, hey there. <laughs> Can you say hi? Yeah. Yeah. Say hi. Yes. Yeah. And that's that's close. Huh? Where's Oliver? Are you Oliver? No. No. Daddy. Daddy. That's daddy. That's true. All right, you want to go get mommy? Can you say bye-bye? Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Right, can you blow kisses? Oh, oh. good job, buddy. I love you. I love you. <laughs> no, no, you're good. He came bursting through the doors like a like a <laughs> western saloon or something. It was really great. <laughs> Um, sorry about that. It's all good. Don't worry. It's great. Um, and at least he didn't do anything dangerous with the pipe. So yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, a rod for a curtain. So it's not, it's not as bad as it just looked much worse. Um, I don't remember what I was saying though. And you were saying so. Um, you were on holiday. And ah, right. You with, had this with SJ, yeah. sure. Um, so there is a there's a passage in uh, just for everybody watching. Um. There's a passage in Josephus, who you know is a first-century CE author, um, who's a, a big source for you know what we know from the first century. Um, but he talks about how Alexander the Great, in his you know process of uh, conquering the the known world at the time, uh, came down to Jerusalem, and instead of conquering it, he you know, paid homage, went into the temple. And, um, but part of that is he was shown the book of Daniel and realized that it was talking about him. Uh, so, you know, from a, from a dating perspective, that seems very much in favor of an early date of Daniel. Sure. Because if you have a, you know, a mid to late fourth century, late fourth century, um, individual who's coming and saying oh look the book of daniel uh you know certainly it had to be written before then so it can't be the second century writing and of course those are uh, talking about the visions section of daniel which is the one that's supposed to be the latest uh, so it's very problematic if that's true yeah. right uh well i'm not a josephus expert right that's that's not i'm not a specialist that's not my field uh, so my response was, yeah, I'd, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't really deal with Josephus. He's very, very late for me. Um, to which she, she responded by like cutting and pasting that 
or something and oh, okay. retweeting it to what her 25,000 followers and saying, Oh, I've, I've asked Dr. Josh about you, but he doesn't want to talk about it. I wonder why it's like, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. okay, well, that's a little sleazy. Um, and so yeah. I spent three hours that morning in my hotel room, uh, <laughs> doing doing a fair amount of research on uh, Josephus and seeing what scholars in the field say about it. And of course, my response was still only, look, yeah. here's a, what appears to be a consensus view on this. That this, is, this is something that was um, you know, not something that Josephus actually knew about. And it's something that he made up for lack of a better term. Sure. Uh, but that sort of thing is some of the stuff that I get. And um, Oftentimes, I've, I've called it the you know the throw it up against the wall and see what sticks, yeah. Sort of approach to arguing with me, and it's frustrating because as you answer those arguments, you know there's a, there's a, an old saying, I can't remember where it comes from, but the, it's essentially the fool can ask more questions than the wisest man can ever answer, and it's it's true. I'm not saying that everybody's a fool and that I'm a wise person. That's not what I'm saying, but no, I, but I, I get what you mean. It's 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 true that, for example, taking yes, Jay again, and again, this is something that can happen very easily. I'm not trying to knock her for this, but it's an example. She she came at me one week with, um, there's a mosaic, a Daniel mosaic, um, and it dates to the, um, I think it dates to the sixth century. Uh, and uh, there's an art, here's an article that goes with it. And this is a Daniel mosaic. And the, it talks about the visions of Daniel and it's from the sixth century. And oh my goodness, of course, look this, how come, how come Josh never mentions this mosaic? You know, oh my goodness. Well, it was the sixth century CE, not BCE. Right. Um, again, the article was a little ambiguous It what well, it didn't say CE, um, and so it's 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 an easy mistake to make that I'm not trying to I'm not I'm not trying to falter for that. Yeah, yeah. But it was, oh, okay, that was wrong. How about this? You yeah, know, yeah. and it's like, okay, look. <laughs> uh, eventually just stop and take stock, you know, I, I'm I'm it, I I deal with the arguments that you throw at me again and again. I I feel like with reasonable certainty, we show this is not a good argument. This is not a good argument. At some point, it's going to behoove you, and not just SJ, I mean, like anybody yeah, that yeah, does yeah. this, it's going to behoove you just stop and read the secondary literature. You know, uh, as much as I disagree with um, Rob Rowe, I don't know if you knew who Rob Rowe is, no. Sentinel Apologetics. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. As much as I disagree with Rob on, on certain issues, one of the things that I do appreciate about him is that uh, he, he, he describes it as going away from social media and soaking in the secondary literature. Right. Okay. And I really appreciated that about him because Rob is a very intelligent guy. Yeah, um, yeah. I think he, I think he has a bit of the Josh disease that <laughs> he hasn't dealt with quite yet okay. in, in its entirety where he, I think he's naturally a little arrogant. Um, and again, I feel comfortable saying that cause I'm naturally arrogant. Um, and I think that comes out sometimes, but you know, uh, I appreciate that about him because he he really does take the scholarship seriously, and he and, and I, I think he tries to go and and really engage with it. And I, I would just mm -hmm. say that's that's a really important aspect to all of this. So, yeah, that was a yeah. really long answer to your question. <laughs> no, Sorry. that's absolutely fine. Don't worry. Um, yeah, I, I I found myself that um, a lot of people really don't like like when you say I don't know or I'm not sure. It's like that's taken as an admission yeah. of you either knowing that well it's, ne it's never charitable as well it's never like you actually don't know it's like you're aware that this is you know you've been caught and yeah. because you're suppressing the truth of god you're yeah. uh yeah it's kind of kind of like that's the approach that gets taken um, it was i, I want to ask you um sure. because i i thought that i watched um i watched that discussion that you had with uh, the catholic versus god yes yeah catholic versus and i thought it was live and I was I was hoping to see what his response would be to my quote, but of course it wasn't. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but watching him, I I just I see my twenty four year old self in 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 how he was behaving. Right. Um, he's obviously right. 
in what he says, even though he pays lip service to, he could be wrong. He's, he's not really, yeah. um, he, he knows he's right. Um, and it would just seem arrogant to, to not say that he could be wrong. Um, but that, ha- I get that response a lot. The, you know, first John two, you never really were a Christian response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can think of few things that people could say to me that would bother me more. Um, and I think probably the reason behind that is because I'm naturally arrogant. Um, I respond very poorly to other people being arrogant. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of just putting this together right now. (laughs) Uh, but I really respond poorly to arrogant people, particularly arrogant people that I know aren't trained in the thing they're being arrogant about. Okay. Um, so how, like, how, how do you deal with that? Sorry. I I know I'm not supposed to be asking the question. No, 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 it's absolutely fine. Um, for, for me, like specifically in that one, I, I'm generally have quite a high tolerance for that sort of thing. Um, um, so like at first, uh, I, well, up to a point, and then I think like I, I do get annoyed. And so like I, I noticed there was a lot of language being sort of like um, brought in. And it, it'd be like, you know, you you weaseled your way out of that one or the, yes. you know, the, the agnosticism being like, like referred to as some sort of like disease that was infecting all my thoughts and stuff like that. And I was like, well, this is like unnecessary um, kind of like, passive aggressive <laughs> yeah it's, it's like trying to bring in all these connotations as if because his position is true then it's acceptable to talk in these terms as if it's like we don't we don't just disagree factually like yeah. on, on certain things yeah. um but then it i i think at those sort of things i do get a bit annoyed because it's like you know genuinely i made massive decisions in my life around what i thought was true and yeah. um, i i made you know, like, like leading Bible studies at work, getting like ridiculed by people, um, the amount of time I put into study, um, yeah. serious relationships, money, all, all sorts of things. It's like to say uh, it wasn't true when it's like, I, yeah. you know, like I, I'm someone who gets really bad depression, for example, my way of dealing with that at the time would be like, well, I'm going to go off into private and pray because that's yeah. how Jesus seems to like recommend dealing with spiritual warfare in the gospels yeah. and stuff. And it's like, yeah, but that was all just, you know, that was just fake. Like I was just, it's, yeah. no, you can't, you can't just say that. And because, but I think you take a step back and look at it. It's because it makes those people really uncomfortable to think about the truth of it, you know, for them, yeah. for them to go, well, here's someone who did think about these things and yeah. came to a different conclusion than me. No, yeah. like it has to, it, I have to make sense of it somehow. And yeah. That's, yeah. It's interesting. Uh, I, in, in sort of in response, and I, I don't know that I realized it was in response to it at the time, um, but in response to someone saying that to me, I, I went and found uh, a sermon of mine. Actually, it was the last sermon that I ever preached okay. uh, at, uh, at the church and l- uploaded it to uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, because while that, you know, obviously that isn't like some sort of proof or something that mm-hmm. um, I had trusted Christ for my salvation, um, it, it 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 would strike someone, I think, very odd to see, it is very odd to see me up there saying the things that I was saying, um, had I not actually uh, believed the things that I was saying. Um, it's just... Uh, The hubris, I guess, that it takes to be able to say to someone, um, "You you really didn't believe." Right. I mean, you talk about you talk about making major life decisions based on what you believe, and I think for me, I I hate hate that I don't believe anymore. Right. I, I hate it. Um, and I've, I've seen you recently as well saying some things about, um, and I don't mean to pry if it's too pert, but like going to a funeral or something as well. Yeah. And as I guess seeing the, the importance maybe for, some, for people of having um, this religious, whether it's social cohesion or belief in the afterlife, the confidence in it. I mean, that was the church that I, that I pastored at. And, and my best friend at that church um, (laughs) 
Sorry, he's back. <laughs> Hi, buddy. <laughs> um, so it was a bad time to be laughing. Yeah. Um, but you know, I remember sitting sitting up there and you know having people. Sorry, pal. <laughs> That's frightening. Um, all right. The cap wasn't off, so it was. <laughs> um, but, you know, listening to people talk about how, um, you know, the sufferings of this present time are not to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And, mm. um, right. Yeah. You know, talking, talking about, uh, at the, at the time of the rapture, you know, we're, we're going to be caught up together Mm. And there's going to be this great reunion and, you know, this body, this, this, um, right. this mortal must put on immortality. And I remember I've, you know, I've, I've been to many funerals and I've yeah. officiated um, funerals and you know, the, the solace, um, the consolation that comes from having, I mean, as you know, from, from having that certainty that this is not the end, um, that this is, this is but the beginning and a, a pretty, a pretty sad beginning because of, you know, this, this flesh, uh, and as, as good as it is, you know, this is, it's, this is just sort of the starting point, um, to, to believe now that it's not the start, that it, this is what we get. Um, I hate it. Mm. And yeah, sure. so, so for those listening that, again, as, as I said in that tweet, you know, those that have trusted in Christ, uh, Christ for your salvation, that, that, that do consider yourselves to be, um, believers, uh, cherish that I would say, um, because it's a, it's something that I'm, I'm sure that as time goes by, I will, I will, I will deal with this, um, in a more, um, I don't know, productive manner, but it just, it just hurts now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's something that I think Christians ought to, because I know that I didn't, I didn't, I didn't relish that. I didn't count that as, as valuable as, right. as it was because it became commonplace to me. Of course, of course, when we die, we, you know, um, you know, for me to live as Christ to die as gain, you know, and, and for me to be here with you is good for you. But if I were to die in the absence of the body present of the Lord, you know, of, of course, of course, all, all those things are going to happen. Um, so that the, the value of that, I think was lost on me because of the, because of its common, you know, the, the common nature of it. So, uh, something to reflect on, I think, for for mm. for Christians. Anyway, no, no, it's a uh, it, it's very interesting. Um, I, have you ever come across a philosopher of religion called Don Cupid at all? Mm -mm. I think um, he did like a BBC um, five part series in like the seventies or something called Sea mm. of Faith. Um, they're all free on YouTube, but I, I watched them the other week and found them very very interesting because. Um, I think he was like an Anglican minister when he was younger and even talks in it about how like um, he was, um, for example, like ministering to people in a hospital when they were dying and stuff and uh, what he thought about when he was younger. And I guess um, <coughs> he sorry. is sorry, he goes through um, talking about a load of these kind of like Christian philosophers and so forth, how they or, or these discoveries, how they affected people's ability to view Christianity for what it is. So hmm. um, for, for example, like uh, the, the theory of evolution or Ga Ga Galileo, Co Copernicus, um, mm -hmm. or also, for, you know, philosophers such as Nietzsche and stuff, um, how they changed the ability of Christianity to be like that kind of fundamental thing and say, you know, say it's, but um, he, but it's interesting when he gets to the end and he talks about the likes of people like Albert Schweitzer um, who, sort of saying yeah okay maybe jesus maybe god doesn't exist um as this fact that's out there maybe jesus wasn't the risen messiah but there's something to this like church community thing um and it's it can be a force for good in the world as mm. uh 
it, it can be this thing that's used to provide people with arms, uh, with uh, economic help, with with emotional help, with support. And, and I think there's something to that. Even if even if naturalism is true, there's something to it. And I, I don't understand why it can't be done with just like this kind of like nihilistic atheism thing, but it, ju it just for whatever reason, it, I, I can't see it. Like I can't, um, you know, like get a bunch of, of like skeptic friends, for example, to decide to to do that same sort of thing that the church does, community. What maybe some people can, um, but I, I wonder what your, you know, what what are your thoughts on say, what the the future of Christianity, given all the the philosophical, scientific, and uh, bib biblical criticism kind of objections? Do you think like where do you see it going? I guess, I guess politically. Um, you actually see this polarization where people are moving more to either the left or the right and becoming like a resurgence of religion or like what how do you how do you see all these things kind of meshing together in the future i'm um, i guess i'm hoping with with each successive generation i'm i'm hoping that i look at megan right megan's an anglican and um there's there's there there was nothing in her uh doctoral work that gave her pause nothing you know um right. and because her faith isn't her faith isn't grounded on the inerrancy of the text uh even even the inspiration of the text um and i think this sort of again heretical uh, but this this sort of approach to the divine of there is a God and God is manifesting himself through humanity um, in these religious texts. And he's doing so in a way that we can we can glean things, um, even if it's in you know a, a, a sort of read a response way. Uh, like like we do with poetry or anything else, um, you can read through, for example, the um, the literary texts, the myths that you know are about Enki or Enlil, you know, or um, you know, the Egyptian gods or whatever. You can read those those works of art, those those literary texts, and and see the divine in it, um, and not be, I guess, beholden in such a way. To the, the the you know these core tenets these um, these dogmas um, and th there's fluidity there's I just I think that what what I see the church doing what I see Christianity doing in its response to these developments is is doing things like okay. Um, yeah, we recognize that you know there's a cosmological genre that appears in the ancient world. All right, Genesis one doesn't necessarily have to be about you know a literal creation. Um, oh, okay, we we hey, look, we've got flood tablets of you know Mesopotamia. Okay, so all right, that flood doesn't have to be the original story. It could be a it could be a polemic um, against the the other flood stories. And and so what it's doing is not trying to give you historical. Uh, telling of how the world went underwater, uh, but what it's doing is it's trying to say that our God is more powerful and our God was justified in um, doing the things that He does. And you know, and you you see this even I think um, when you move into the conquest accounts uh, in the Book of Joshua, and you read through you know Lawson Younger, Lawson Younger, the, the evangelical at it at Trinity, and when he wrote his dissertation, he he looked at Joshua nine through twelve, and he says, okay. Do these do, do the language um, syntams these these segments that appear in these uh, in these passages? Do they do they look like other ancient Near Eastern conquests accounts? Yeah, they they do. There's a lot of similarity between them. So how does that inform uh, our understanding of what the text is doing? And I right. think as as you do that, um, you begin to see. I guess the same would be true if, if we didn't have the genre of poetry today. 
and we were to read day and you know the psalmist right day and night my tears have been my food you know, if we didn't have poetry we might say okay so this is we dietary you know practices in the ancient near east you know uh, but then as you as you discover oh look you know poetry oh maybe that's what this is also oh, maybe he's not trying to say that he was eating his tears maybe he's trying to what is the truth value of that statement and um, I think being able to go to other genres uh, in the biblical text and do that. But I'm, what I guess what I'm saying or what I'm hoping is that we get beyond the text. Um, okay. We get beyond the text in the sense that um, we can recognize the divine working in that text. The, a particular community, a particular community interacting with the divine through their writing through their traditions and be able to see what is common to these, you know, different spiritual communities uh, that, that can allow us to get at um, the divine will, what it is that God wants. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that I believe necessarily that, but, but that's a, mm. what that does, I think, is it, it allows, it allows for us to do what we naturally do anyway. Um, it seems anyway. And that is to say slavery's bad, right? right. Slavery's bad. Um, genocide is bad, right? So, okay. People don't go slavery's bad. Wait a second. Leviticus 25 says that slavery's okay. <laughs> All right. I guess slavery's okay. Right. People today don't do that. They go slavery's bad. Ooh, man, that, that Leviticus 25 passage really bothers me. How do I make that make sense of what I know to be wrong? Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that if we get past the text, if we can get beyond the text in that sense, um, as, as our sense of morality develops, um, and again, I'm, I'm outside of my field here. Yeah, sure. So, you know, sure. take, take this with uh, the grain of salt that it should come with. Um, but I think that, you know, we can, we can allow what we, what we seem to naturally do anyway, um, to do so in a way that doesn't have to fight against uh, these passages. Because I, I think that if, you know, Megan, Megan reads Leviticus 25, 44 to 46 and goes, yeah, that's bad. And that doesn't bother me in the sense that I, I'm not beholden to that text as an inspired yeah. and errant text. It's another ancient Near Eastern text. Um, but I, I can believe that God utilized those people um, in a way that fit his will. Um, and it doesn't really have to go much beyond that. Mm. So, sure. Um, so I'm a little bit wary of time, but I, I suppose a couple of things quickly to to ask you would be: then, what are the, uh, in terms of like what you're doing doing academically, what what you know now, um, what would you say are the biggest errors that Christians make? So, say in approaching the the Old Testament and these kind of ancient Near Eastern cultures, mm. um, and I've seen some people, for example, try and deal with stuff like um, the Code of Hammurabi versus like the Decalogue or um, stuff like uh, the Epic of Gilgal and, and square those things away in very weird ways. But but for someone who actually knows what they're talking about in these domains, what do you see as like, uh, you know, the, the main places that Christians can go wrong? I, I mean, I think that, well, <laughs> excuse me. Um, I think a lot of Christians, whether they realize it or not, um, view the Hebrew Bible as, as having been developed in some sort of a vacuum, a cultural vacuum. Um, it, it, in, in the sense that, um, I guess with the result that the, the Hebrew Bible uh, and, the, and the laws that exist in it, for example, are so much better and they're just, just got because it's god that gave them um they're so much better and so much more developed and uh there's to the point and 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 part of the i think the rationale behind that is by utilizing the text the biblical text to inform their understanding of the history of of the period so for 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 example if you you know if you were to read through taking it outside of the biblical text if you were to read through royal inscriptions of an, of an ancient near eastern king 
you would think that his enemies were some horrible people, right? I mean, they were just, they're monsters that needed to be wiped out. They needed to be wiped out because look how horrific they were. Um, and the king, that, that Mesopotamian king was doing the will of the gods. Uh, of course, as we know, uh, it, when the Egyptian king writes something, that talks about how evil the Hittite king was, or the Hittites were, and the Hittite king is going to write about how you know, bad the Egyptians were. I mean, this is this is this is sort of how this plays out, right? I mean, this is and this is part of what Lawson Younger was getting at in his in his, his book on Joshua. So, um, and this is nothing necessarily new. We know this stuff. This is what royal inscriptions do. They they do something. Um, uh, so I think that. When you read through the biblical text and you say, look, the Canaanites, they're horrible, horrible people. God was being very patient with them for 400 years. Look, it says so. Um, it might be a good idea to, to, to go back and to read about what we know about the Amarna period, for example, you know, and, and the, the large group of texts that we have from the 14th century uh, that are letters back and forth. Uh, of all the kings and you know they're writing to each other about sort of what we might consider trivial matters and then reading all the letters that come from uh canaan at the time you know and the 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 information that we get from uh a, a, about the region and i mean there's a lot of information out there that i think many christians on social media don't know about um, and if they do know about it, they haven't really taken the time to read it. This is one of the things that I really appreciate about, um, you know, seminaries like Trinity, because uh, I, I have a real fondness for them. Um, they're very well attuned. I mean, the, Richard Averbeck, Lawson Younger. I mean, these are these are biblical scholars that have trained extensively in Sumerian and Akkadian. I mean, Richard Averbeck studied under. Um, Oh, that's terrible. Schoberg, I think Oka Schoberg uh, wrote, um, I think he wrote his, was it his dissertation? I think he wrote his dissertation on Gudea. This doesn't mean anything probably to anybody watching, sorry. But <laughs> I mean, he, you know, he's, th these are guys that are serious about studying the ancient Near East and they, they, they understand it very well. Um, and that's what I think if you're going to, if you, I think Christians need to strive to be those type of Christians, it's Christians that that are actively trying to understand the ancient Near Eastern context and not trying to understand it simply to prove the Bible right. That's a right. really bad way to go about this. Yeah. Uh, but to understand it on its own terms, so that when you come back to the biblical text, you can say, "Oh, yeah, sure, Ezekiel twenty six, Ezekiel got the Tyre prophecy wrong." frankly who gives a fuck right i mean it, it's it's that's okay um yeah sure daniel's written in the second century that's okay theologically that's fine you know it's not that's not problematic um because this is this is how ancient writing works i mean i think about somebody like john collins uh i, I think john collins is a catholic right so he's a theist mm. so i would say he's a christian i know that many listening would say <laughs> he's not a christian but whatever um and he He's arguing, I think, very well that, that Daniel's written in the second century. So um, that's not required for his faith. And I think that there are a lot of things in the Old Testament, a lot of beliefs that, that Christians on YouTube have. Those beliefs are not required for your faith to be sound. They're just not. It's going to take a shift. It's going to require you... I think addressing what your core beliefs need to be and not to be. Um, I think that's very important because if, if we're, if we're trying to get at uh, the best explanation, the best interpretation for the data points, we have to do that. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So um, for people who want to kind of like see more of what you're doing, what, what have you got anything coming up that you'd want to promote or, um, where, where can people contact you? Where's the best kind of so, place to get in touch? Yeah, you can always reach us at our website, digitalhammurabi.com. Um, our email address is very original, digitalhammurabi at gmail.com. 
<laughs> excuse me. Um, we just finished up a five part, somewhat lengthy uh, dating of Daniel series. It's not about going on a date with Daniel, <laughs> even though that seems to be quite popular. Um, but uh, I'm always on Skylar's show. Not always, but often on Skylar Fiction. So uh, if you go to Skylar Fiction, I think it's just Skylar Fiction on YouTube. Um, you can you can see us there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I the Slaver book should be coming out soon. If anybody's interested in learning, uh, you know, engaging with the ancient Near East a little bit more, I wrote this book just recently. Learn to read ancient Sumerian and introduction for complete beginners. Um, and I, I actually, Megan, Megan and I co co-authored it. It's got great exercises in it. It's, it's sold a, several hundred copies already, which is pretty cool. But, um, yeah, if you're interested in getting into to those ancient languages, that might be a good place to start, but sorry, it's probably more than you wanted me to say. No, no, I, it's absolutely great. Yeah, no, you should do um, some more of those language ones on, on all those other because I, I know, like it, it's difficult, I think, to find um, really well put together books on Greek as well because there's all the there's all the confusion between different dialects and, uh, and and no one really like ever explains that, but or at least from me trying to figure things out on my own, no one ever clearly explains those differences. So you just kind of end up with some hodgepodge mess of. Yeah. Uh, weird vocabulary and different ways of writing that make no sense. <laughs> if anybody out there is interested, or Nathan, if you're interested in learning um, like biblical Greek, Koine Greek, there is a book um, put out by William Mounts. It's called okay. The Basics of Biblical Greek. It's probably the best that I've seen. It's the one that, that I used uh, on my own. I used it on my own to study, to learn Greek uh, before I got to seminary because that's the kind of nerd I am. I have to learn it before I learn it. Um, but it's very, it's, it's actually my writing style was sort of modeled off of that. It's, it's meant to be very down to earth, understandable. Um, but yeah. So yeah, no, I'll definitely, I'll definitely check that out. Well, I appreciate you coming on and taking this time out of your oh, weekend anyway. To Wonderful. To no, I really, it was a lot of fun. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, so I'm going to just end the live stream it's like a five second delay so that's all right or maybe even longer than five seconds <laughs> it's the best kind of delay <laughs>